the song we just sang sticks in my memory from a little boy. Well, he would sing that song in the old Woodman of the World building where my dad preached. Tremendous song, still needed today. You know, a lot of times we don't grasp what the Bible is saying because we don't look at the overall story of it. And having reference to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, thought of that chapter begins at about verse 7 of chapter 11. If you have your Bible open, if you'll start right there with me and follow the theme it goes throughout the rest of the book. Ecclesiastes 11, beginning at verse 7. Truly, the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Therefore, remove sorrow from thy heart, put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. While the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, then thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun, or the light, or the moon, or the stars be not darkened, for the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they're few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened, and the doors shall be shut in the streets, when the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high, and fear shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go by the streets. Wherever the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed, and sought out, and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies which are given from one shepherd. And further by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Let us pray. Father, we're grateful that we have another Lord's Day, first day of the week to live. 
We appreciate the beauties of it, the morning's food. We're grateful for the set time that has been given for us to be here in the name of our Son Jesus. We pray, Father, that we'll recognize that the most powerful thing in this world is your believed and obeyed will of God. Help us to know this book. Help us to believe it with all of our hearts. Help us to try our best to render obedience to it from the depths of our hearts. Help us to know that the answer to the troublesome times in which we live is thy son and the gospel truth that he left behind. Help us to know that there is hope, not necessarily in this world, but in the one to come. May our hope be founded upon these eternal truths that will take us out of this veil of tears and troubles and trials and problems of every nature. Take us to a sweet, peaceful land where thy son Jesus is. Thou art God, you are there, and through your son Jesus' name we pray at this time. Amen. Last week in our study in the 20th chapter of the book of Revelation, we dealt with the great white throne scene. A statement was made by one of our students in that class that made me do some real thinking. And I don't know if she realized what she said, but the more I thought about it and the more I recognized if we want to be true to the text of the Bible, Revelation chapter 20 is a chapter full of figurative expressions. In fact, the whole book of Revelation is figurative, symbolic. It says one thing, but if you know what the rest of the Bible teaches, you can properly understand what it says in the light of the rest of the Bible. Do you know why the millennial theory has been so fantastic in the minds of so many people in our world? Revelation 20 is the only place you find it. Nowhere else in the Bible do you find this subject mentioned. Old Testament or New. That's why you need to be very careful. If you find something in the book of Revelation that is not mentioned anywhere else, you need to be very careful that you don't misinterpret it and misapply it and come up with a false idea. And that's what so many people have done in Revelation chapter 20. But the last part of the chapter that we studied last week, the great white throne scene. The great white throne would represent the phrase in the rest of the Bible, the judgment seat of Christ. Who is it that will be on the throne of judgment? Jesus will be there. It's going to be his judgment seat. Well, in saying that, we need to recognize that 
God is going to be there too. The great white throne of God, the great white throne of Jesus, the judgment seat, the judgment bar of God. The Bible teaches this all over the place. There's a statement that Jesus made one time that I put in that number three, judge righteous judgment. You know, a lot of people think that all judging is wrong. And that you can't make any judgments of any kind. Well, if you are pointing your finger and passing sentence on people and telling them that they're going straight to hell, then you need to back off from that sort of attitude. I don't have the right to pronounce anybody into heaven or hell. And I've tried my best to refuse to do that through the years. Or had all kinds of unusual things uh, confront you at the back door of the funeral home. Whenever you don't preach a person straight into heaven, uh, they jump you about it. They say, you mean to say you think my daddy went to hell? I said, I didn't say anything about your daddy going to hell. Well, what she heard was that I didn't preach him into heaven. I don't have the right to preach anybody into heaven or hell either one. And I'm not going to do that because I'm playing God when I do so. God knows who it is that's going to heaven and he knows who's going to hell. And that's his business. And I need to stay out of that business. So if you judge righteous judgment... Is that something we can do as individual people? Yes. But the reason I put that in that outline, there's going to be nothing but righteous judgment given at the great white throne of God. You see, God knows the whole story. We don't most of the time. You know, all of us have our past that we're not very proud of. And if we're not careful, we will be too demanding on other people because of what we have had to endure. You know, we need to walk in the shoes of other people. And if you only knew the drastic situations they had to deal with. If we only knew how their heart had bled for weeks and months and years, and that heart was still bleeding within them. And I'm not talking about the physical blood pump. You know, it's one thing to bleed blood, but it's another thing to bleed grief, sorrow, and sympathy. You know, the difference between sympathy and empathy. Empathy is to be able to put yourself in the shoes of another person and empathize with them. Sympathy is expressing sorrow and condolences when somebody's had a sickness or a death in the family, and it needs to be done. But righteous judgment is going to be found at the judgment seat of Christ. He's not going to make any mistakes. He's going to see the rest of the story. He knows what we have been through. Now, in this great white throne scene, it blends right in to the next chapter. If you look and ask yourself the question, who is it? that is going to be cast into hell. According to the book of Revelation, number 7, 10 through 15 summation of that chapter, if this chapter means what it says, and it, it, a lot of figurative expressions, but I believe we can conclude that those who will be in the lake of fire 
will be the devil, the beast, as represented in the last few chapters of the book of Revelation, the false prophet, death, and hell itself will be in hell. See, the word hell, depending on the context where it's found, sometimes means just the unseen gray world. Sometimes hell means Tartarus, the torment side of the Hadean world. Sometimes the word hell means paradise. Be careful in your use of the word hell in the English Bible that you don't get it mixed up with something. But those who will go into the confines of the lake of fire will be those whose names are not written in the book of life. And you know what another word for eternal hell is? The second death. There's two deaths. Physical death of the human body where the soul and the body separates. That's what the word death means. Separation. It's one thing to die the death of the physical body. But the second death is not going to have anything to do with this body. The second death is going to have something to do with the new body that we receive upon the resurrection from the dead. And that new body, which will live forever in one of two places, heaven or hell, the eternal abode of those who had no use for God. Well, how will death mean, the second death, what will it mean? A separation from God forever. Our minds have a hard time accepting that. We don't know what that means. We think we do, but the second death of being separated from God you know, that's the only letter says, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You know what's going to happen to people who are not ready for Jesus to come back? They're going to be banished from the presence of the Lord forever. We don't know nothing about that. The Lord is as close as the breath you breathe right now. The Lord is all over this universe. We live and move and have our very being in him. He is as close to us as the very air we breathe. But the trouble of the second death is, it's going to be separation from God. He's not going to be anywhere near that place. And we have no way of understanding that. That's terrible. Now, chapter 21 picks up and goes on with the views of eternity in the sense of the new heavens and new earth. We won't be able to get through the whole chapter. There's just too much material here. And we'll probably, we'll probably finish the book of Revelation by the end of this year, we've only got about three, three more Sundays to go, and uh, so we'll, we'll finish up the book of Revelation and get into something else uh, first of the year. In Revelation 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Well, the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away 
all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, and murderers, and homongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let's stop right there, because the symbolic figurative passage concerning heaven is what is coming up in great detail. And uh, we've got a lot of assignment here to get through these first eight verses. What did John say he saw? And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. Let that sink in. What did John say that he saw? He said, I saw a new heaven, a new earth. Do you know how many times that fits in the rest of the Bible? It fits perfectly with Second Peter chapter Three. You see, this is where the beauty of the scriptures come in. The premillennials can't go to another passage of scripture anywhere else in the Bible to support their interpretation of Revelation 20. But we can go immediately to Second Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. And here, the same idea is being discussed by Peter in his writings. He said, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, into which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Can you think of another place in the Bible where this idea of a new heaven and new earth is discussed. You can, you don't think about it a minute. What was Jesus having reference to when he said in John 14? He said, In the Father's house are many mansions. The word our soul would have told you. He said, I go to prayer place for you. If I go to a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. See, Jesus referred to this idea of new heavens and a new earth. Danny Cottrell held me over at Orange, uh, I guess it was, last year. And uh, Danny and I have known each other since Lipscomb days, and he gave a remark on what Jesus said in John 14 on mansions that I'd never, ever heard before. Do you know what Jesus meant when he said, in the Father's house are many mansions? 
Another word would be rooms, or another room. Uh, a place uh, that Jesus is preparing. So he made reference to some old parking lot attendant or some janitor or something uh, was asked about what was meant by these mansions in heaven. And I just remember the punchline. And I hope I never forget it. Do you know what is so wonderful about the mansion that Jesus is preparing for us on the other side? Is it going to be made out of precious metal? Is that what it is? Is it going to be the one just as close to God as it can possibly be geographically? You know what the term mansion means? Permanent. Permanent. It'll be there forever. You know of anything permanent here in this world? The old home place where my dad was raised over on uh, John's River. Back when I was a boy, we'd go over there and swimming in the old bob hole down there on John's River. The old house is standing up there where they live. Guess what? It's gone. It's gone. How many old home places where people were raised? I'm gone. Fell down. Time has destroyed it. The mansions of heaven will be permanent. Never change. Never fall down. Nothing can change that place that God has prepared for his people. I hope we'll think a little bit deeper than what we have when we study the Bible. We need to recognize that this new heaven and new earth that John said he saw. I was holding a meeting in Saltwell, Virginia years ago. We were living in East Tennessee and uh, I don't know what happened, the preacher that was supposed to come for the meeting or something got sick, or, but he wasn't able to come. So they called me, and I stayed with the preacher, and Joyce was teaching school at the time, and she got to come up on the weekend. But one morning, I'm studying for my lesson that night in the preacher's house, and somebody knocked at the front door. And I went to the door, and you know who it was? The Jehovah's Witnesses were knocking doors. And I was nice to them. They were nice to me. But they had a copy of their Watchtower Bible. And they showed me in their Bible where we were there in Second Peter 3 a minute ago. Their Bible don't read like ours does where we read the passage in 2 Peter 3 where it said, uh, verse 10, and I think I referred to it, and, and they turned uh, in their Bible to 2 Peter 3, verse 10, and they wanted me to see that their Bible didn't read like mine did. Instead of burned up, like the King James Version, and other acceptable translations suggest the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. You know what their translation says? Be discovered. Is that right? Well, they just tripped around and got a good word to get away from what the Bible really says about the 
termination of the earth, it's going to be burned up, it's going to be dissolved and gone out of the picture. They believe that the earth that we are now on and the works therein will be rediscovered. They'll be remade and made into something better. The new heavens and new earth. But did you hear what Jesus said in Revelation 21? Where is this new heaven and earth going to come from? Coming down from God out of heaven. New Jerusalem. There's so many people trying to make the Bible say what they want it to say. Even to the point of modern translations that they have plotted and schemed and reworded to support their doctrine. They don't believe that there's going to be a hell at all. And that the uh, hell of the Bible is a complete mistranslation. And even some of my brethren out on the West Coast that have got some ideas along that line. I've been getting some material in the mail for several years. And all of a sudden this piece came from out there. And this writer, this preacher was suggesting there ain't no such thing as hell. It's a mistranslation of the Hebrew and Greek into the English. I wish I could believe that there's no hell, but I've read the Bible too much. I've been into it for years and years and years. The new heavens and the new earth are going to come down from God out of heaven. And that's the new Jerusalem that's coming down. Now, I'd like to kind of shift gears a little bit right here and let this passage of Scripture in Revelation 21 teach us who it is that's going to go to heaven and who it is that's going to lose their souls in the place the Bible calls hell. Now, any time you can find cross-references to the same subject material in the rest of the Bible, then you need to pay close attention to what it says. Now, I didn't write this passage, and Alexander Campbell didn't write it. It's not a passage the Church of Christ has put into existence. It is truth that Jesus put in existence. Look at Matthew 7, 13, 14. In Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus is doing the speaking. And he makes it crystal clear. There's going to be two places of abode on the other side. He said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in there at. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. I'll be the first to admit that in my first few younger years of preaching that I guess I had in my mind that a few meant two or three. Now, if you're at a roadside market and you're buying some uh, vegetables, a few might mean two or three. But if you take the rest of the Bible on this idea in Matthew 7, 13, and 14, the many which would go in thereat would be a whole lot of the population of the earth. Not everybody's going to lose their soul. But if you've got the idea that only two or three, then you need to remember what we've studied in the book of Revelation the last few months. There's a great host of people 
according to uh, Revelation chapter 7, along there where we were studying the 144,000, uh, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And then after that conclusion was reached, we saw where uh, a great host, a renewal from every nation on earth, would be in the expanses of the place of eternal reward with the Lord. Think about all the billions of people that have lived on the face of the earth. Think about all the millions and millions of little babies that have been aborted in the abortion clinics of this country. Where did their souls go? They had a soul from the moment of conception. The Bible means what it says. The souls of those little babies populate heaven. Populate heaven. Who will go to heaven? A whole lot less than some of us may think. The American people have become so opinionated about things. Different polls have been made through the years to the American people. In asking who do you think will go to heaven, most of those polls suggest that everybody thinks they're going to heaven. Well, just because you may think and I may think that we're going to heaven doesn't mean we're going to go. Place called heaven and place called hell. Who will go there? Revelation 3 verse 5 Earlier in our studies, we saw, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Here Jesus makes it clear that those who keep their garments washed white in the blood of the Lamb are going to be those people that will populate heaven. As long as we stay faithful, you may think that a little bit of bread and a little bit of grape juice on Sunday is not really necessary. God says it is. And if you're wise, you won't forget Jesus on the Lord's table. Not any given Sunday, period. In the hospital, if they can have surgery on Monday morning, that would probably be a providential reason. But some of the trumped up excuses that people give for not remembering the body and the blood of the Lord could very well cost them their soul. And the funny thing about it is, you know, the Lord knows where we are. He knows where we are. Do I know where I am when it comes to remembering Jesus? It makes a difference. Uh, the loving, faithful, obedient will go to heaven. Those are interesting verses. John 13, 35. Read that one for us, uh, Brother uh, Philip. Paul, read for us... Uh, uh, 1 John 5, verse 2. Uh, will Tom read for us uh, 2 John 6? The loving, faithful, obedient will go ahead. Okay, uh, John 13, 35, 1 John 5, verse 2, 2 John 6. Okay. It doesn't take much to see that Jesus has made it clear who it is that are his disciples. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one another. 
Okay, First John 5, verse 2. The Paul. If you want to walk a circle around yourself, and I walk one around myself, how can we know that we love the children of God? If we keep His commandments. Keeping the commandments is part of going home to heaven. Uh, Second John six, will you help, please? You know, I have distinct memories embedded in my mind of uh, some of the looser brethren through the years who just jumped up and down. That love is not keeping a set of rules. What did he just read? And this is love. What's love? Here? That we walk after his commandments. And that's not keeping a set of rules. I don't know what it is. Some 20, 30 years ago, we started hearing strange sounds in the brotherhood of the Church of Christ. They got to making fun of the five steppers. You know what's on the new marquee digital sign on the church going toward funded on across the railroad? Guess what's on that marquee? Must believe. Then it flashes another one. Must confess. Must repent. Must be baptized. That restored my faith. Would be in some of my breath. When salvation has been made fun of, it has been called a, a bunch of five steppers. Listen. Keeping the commandments of God makes us a loving, faithful, obedient. That's interesting. The full of faith will go to heaven. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, there's another interesting verse that you don't hear a lot. I don't know if people are scared of it or what, but it says what it says. In 1 Peter 4, 17 through 19, let it speak. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, where shall the end, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Now, I don't know how you feel about that two verses, but I don't have any problem. I've believed them a long, long time. If the righteous scarcely be saved, now you can hang on that whatever you want to, but if that meaning comes out like I know it to be, if the righteous be scarcely saved, they're going to be saved. It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. But don't say that the Bible doesn't say that the righteousness has nothing to do with being saved. It says, if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Who's going to heaven? Who's going to hell? Now, you said we don't get very far until it's gone. Uh, Revelation 21 is where we are. 
I've got an old sermon outline on heaven and who is going there that deals with Revelation chapter 21. Uh, and uh, time's gone, and uh, the fact that gone over a couple minutes. Well, well, we'll pick up there next Sunday and move on into the book of Revelation. Thank you for your attention. I had all this material together, and I set my mind to try to get through it, but it didn't make it all. But we'll try to finish up and have another outline the next Sunday. Thank you for your attention.